determined. I've already fixed it. I've already ordered the steps. I'm already molding you to shape you to be the image of my son. Now that's hard for those who sub subscribe to the Armenian thought that somehow um, the people who are not going to make it are not good enough. But if I'm doing all this good out here, then why wouldn't I be? Or why would God select some but not others? But everything we read here is from a, uh, lack of a better term, a Calvinistic point of view of God's doing the choosing. And so he's chosen some, but he's not choosing everybody. And why would God do that? Why would he? That's, I'm asking, why would Are he? Are those others that he's not selecting, not saved? Do they not believe in him? Well, we even, weren't. Even two. We, we weren't saved, he but he chose us. He chose us to be saved. To, ah, he's, he had selected us. So, so let's say uh, we got a hundred people in this room. God looks down and says, "So fifty-five of us walk out, going to heaven." The other cats in the room, like, "So what's what's next for us?" We look back and say, "Ah, bruh, yeah, you ain't gonna make it." Now everyone says that don't really seem fair that God didn't call and choose them. Now there's the efficacious call that God Christ makes to everyone. There's the general call. I came and died for the sins of the world. And then there's the efficacious call. There's that singular call that pulls some and others are not pulled in. Why come? Well, that's not a class we want to take, because we ain't gonna ever get that, we ain't gonna ever get that answer on why God choose some and why God didn't choose others. He says, some are for my pleasures and some are for wrath. So I, he chose us, mm -hmm. and then, so why is it that we have to go and bring people to him? Mm -hmm. Because because you know he because we don't know who he's chosen, mm -hmm. and he has used us to evangelize and share this much like he did with Israel. He already has sent Israel his Jews for his people, but he said, "You are going to be my people to represent me in the world, that they would might know who I am, even though." The Babylonians, not mine, Canaanites. But in fact, he told the Israelites, go kill all the Canaanites. Kill them all. He said, kill everybody that's in, annihilate the whole, and be done with it. But they didn't. So he said, okay, because you disobeyed me, the Canaanites are going to be a thorn in your flesh. You're going to always be fighting with them, squabbling with them, because you didn't do what I said. Now I'm quite sure the Israelites are like, we're supposed to kill over everybody. He's going to kill, you just want us to kill everybody. He said, yeah. Now, when doesn't make sense for us that we serve this loving God that tells his people to go out and annihilate a whole group of people. But God knows his bigger plan. And the reason that he wanted to do away with the Canaanites is because their sin was so horrific, the nastiness that they was doing. He said that the earth cries up from their filth and nastiness. I want you to go eradicate them for me. I'm going to use your hand to kill them out. I'm not playing with them. You go kill them out for me. So, so God, who creates us and makes us, get to make the determination of kill them all. He ain't telling us that I want to go on record and say, is that on the video? I'm going on record and say, God is not telling us now to go kill nobody. But in the Old Testament, he definitely said to the Jews, I want you to go wipe them off. You had your hand up. And I was just going to say, he has mercy on whom he chooses. And that's what he says. I get to determine who I have mercy on and who I do not have mercy on. So, yes. That kind of opens up right. another why question, though. <laughs> like, you just kind of open up the gates for me out of my mind. Like, right. uh -huh. why? So, in that case, then it makes me question okay, what if ever, like, is there not room in heaven for everybody? What if everybody went to heaven and hell was just for, like, I Same. guess the people that are, yeah, for he was the only one. And that's what, and, he, and the scripture tells us hell was made, made for Satan. It was never intended for man, it's man's rebellion. That, okay. has, that, okay. has, that has put him there. Remember, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Man's rebellion, mm -hmm. man's sin yeah. places him there. His unwillingness to obey God. And God said to Israel, when you go over to Deuteronomy, he says, I'm telling you, if you obey me, there are blessings. But if you disobey me, there's curses. And guess what? Later on he said, and I know you're going to disobey me. He said, go back and tell them I know they're going to disobey me. And sure enough, them jokers walked out and disobeyed him. And you would think that after he told them this, like, think about it, we don't do it. God tells us to obey him. We still go out and act the donkey. We still go out and do stuff that we're not supposed to do. So maybe could that be a reason, not to say why, but maybe that could be 
a reason why he selects who he selects because he knew that we would rebel and that's why he's not picking everybody? Well, see, now you're putting it back on it's us. It's because us, when you look at it, and, and the challenging part about understanding the free election doctrine is, is God choosing or is he knowing that you're not going to choose him, which is what everybody kind of juggles with. He knew that I would accept his call. Well, when we talk about this and we're in Romans, it has nothing to do with us accepting his call from this point. Now, we do, when we say this word, we accepted Jesus Christ. But in actuality, we were selected more so than we accepted. It does not take the onus off of us as believing and being obedient. But definitely you can see through his wording, and there are other scriptures to support this, that says that I am selecting you unto myself. That's why you can't hide from God. John, where Jonah attempted to hide, God says, I know, I know where you were. I put you there. I knew you were going to run. I let, you, I let you be swallowed up. I let you sit in the, the belly. And then I, when I'm ready for you, I let you be coughed up. Now are you ready? And he goes. Jonah goes. He sits under a tree, depressed and angry because God still won't kill the people of Nineveh. God lets the tree die over him. The little tree that was giving him shade in the high sun because he's up there pouting because God said, you're still going to yeah, preach to him. You're still going to do it. He sits down and he gets mad. God lets the tree die. He gets mad because God lets the tree die. So him and God have a dialogue about who God is. I get to make the determination of who gets saved. You don't get to do it. I think if, if we can get out of this kind of humanistic philosophy that somehow or other we are in some type of control or we got something to do with it, the moment that we release, it's like tug of war. The moment we quit trying to think that we tug of war with God and we let go, then we take that deep breath and say, my, my steps are ordered by the Lord. Truly, my steps are ordered by God. He is determining my direction, my going in and my coming out. My days are numbered. When he says enough, I will lay down and die. That's a fact, except for the rapture. So there is no battle. God's not battling with us. This little bit that we're doing, where we think we're doing something and we're rebelling against God, God said, yeah, you're not showing me nothing. Because if I really want you, I'll put you to sleep. I'll put you in your, your sick bed, and then I'll make you cry out for me. Or I, I have you... Uh, like the king that's eating grass, I can have y'all go crazy real quick. You just eating grass and grazing and looking at somebody. That's a, that's a shame that Kyron out there eating that grass. Out there. <laughs> somebody go get that baby. And then, of course, she comes to herself. Says, okay, that's God. <laughs> so, let me jump into something. Turn In your books, turn into, I want to jump from the special revelation. Let's talk about the canonization or canonicity of scripture. Page 7, 16. I'm going to try to make this quick. This is important, and this is the discussion we got into a few minutes ago about the scriptures and how they are canonized. Canonized means how they are structured. Canon in, in the Greek means um, standard, ruler. So that's what this means. Down at the bottom where it says canonicity, each of the 66 books of the Bible have been recognized as inspired revelations from God as teaching with normative authority and therefore a canonical. Canonicity presupposes revelation, inspiration, and authority. The books of the Bible were inspired when they were written. When they were received as inspired, they became part of the canon, the collection of inspired writings. So, this inspiration, this ideal of inspiration only applies to the original autographs. Let me say it one more time. Inspiration of the Bible only applies to the original autographs. Now your head is crinkled up and you're looking at me kind of strange. Go back to page 12 in that same book. Somebody turn to 2 Timothy 3 and 16. Hold that for me. Let's talk about inspiration real quick. While special revelation communicates the redemptive message God wants sinners to know, inspiration was God's way of seeing to it that the special revelation and words were preserved. So God is containing his word 
by preserving it himself, making sure that it's free from error, that it's free from fallibility. Let's keep going. Uh, was perceived from error and...